Okay, so I'm going to talk about preprints primarily in this session, and I'm going to do that from the perspective of the PRC model, which I will get onto. If you have any questions afterwards that we don't get to address, feel free to uh, chat to me or ASF bio on the social channels or send me an email. I'm always happy to talk about anything in here a lot more. So ASAP Bio is a nonprofit. We've been around now for about eight years and we are very much focused on all things preprint and that includes open peer review. And we do this largely through advocacy and uh, community building efforts. So just as a way of introduction as to why we need change in the current system. We've had a lot of large technological leaps and advances, uh, certainly since these graphs were done in the 80s. And despite this, what we're seeing is that actually publishing in a journal takes longer than it ever, ever has. And so on the left here, this is the time it takes to get your first, first author paper. Uh, and you can already see this is 10 years out of date. But within a 30 year period, this went up on average by, uh, I think it's a year and a half or so. And that of course will have grown since this graph was, was made. And the part of the reason it's taking this long is that the amount of data required for a paper is now more than it ever has been. And I, I, I love this graph. Um, this illustrates the amount of panels. So this is a, a rough estimation as to how much science, I guess, there is in a paper. So this is Cell, Nature, and the Journal of Cell Biology. So 1984, you can see there was a, a relatively low number of total panels. And in 2014, not only is that, in most cases, at least doubled, but we also have supplementary material now. And the supplemental material is as big as, if not much bigger, than an entire paper in the 1980s. And this is just, it's not sustainable. And it, it questions why we have such an emphasis on the paper instead of these individual outputs that could be shared quicker and, and the system could just be done in a much more efficient way. And there's also a huge cost to the science generally. And I focused here on APCs and peer review. So a recent estimate suggested that globally, it costs about $6 billion just on peer review activity. And that is largely coming from not paying peer review. So this is accounting for the time and the, the costs of someone's time in peer reviewing a paper. And this is an enormous amount of money. The other thing in terms of cost is that, as I'm sure many of you are aware, journals have profit margins, well publishers, sorry, have profit margins of around 35 to 40%. It's bigger than any of the big technology companies. And the open access movement resulted largely in article processing charges. And this graph here is showing you between 2015 and 2018, journals managed to make over $1 billion just from article processing charges. We've come a long way since then in that there are even more journals with APCs attached to them. So this number has very much increased since this, this data was gathered. And the other thing just to highlight here is that this is uniquely a life sciences problem. And I'm not going to really get into why that is, but I would argue we've kind of done this to ourselves. But that also means we can get ourselves out of this situation. And why does this situation exist? It's very much because publishing is this tangled thing of dissemination, peer review, curation, and prestige, but that's all done by journals. It's all one process. And this 
motivates actually people to delay sharing work and you know we've, we said here it's for this idea of having a complete story and that's because this process extends beyond this into research culture more widely which is you need to publish in certain journals in order to get more to be more competitive for jobs or for funding and that's deeply problematic and really our suggestion here and the point of this talk is that we need to untangle this this publishing system and this is kind of in my mind one of the most viable and most attractive options to do this and this is the publish review curate model if you're not familiar with that it's shown here but the idea is you first share your work and that's uncoupled from the rest of the process so this is the dissemination step i would argue you should do that via preprints but by uncoupling this it also allows you to share data code open notebooks negative data is easier to share it opens up what we can share and what we think of as an output the next step would be peer review and so this could be journals uh, eLife would be an example it could be individuals doing peer review maybe it's part of a journal club or services like PCI who are a peer review service this again is uncoupled from the curation step now at the moment some services put these things together um, which is also an option and in the curation step that's where maybe this is journals maybe this is peer review services curation projects individuals this is where you bring the review and all of these outputs not just a paper you bring all this together in one place and that might be the place where you get this kind of badge of reliability or trustworthiness um, it might be where you get some of the prestige still but I would argue that actually by separating these three steps out we also by virtue of doing this separate prestige out and what these steps allow us to do is actually give much greater recognition for individual components by separating dissemination and peer review that alone has suddenly made these two things more valuable and dissemination is already quite valuable to researchers but peer review is a lot of effort and there's not a lot of credit with that and so if we can separate that out suddenly we can start giving researchers a lot more credit for doing peer review activities for example and equally we could also start giving people credit for curating literature and so this is a very very good solid model that I'm going to now build off on and say why preprints are central to this model if you're not familiar with a preprint we will come on to that but one of the most often spoken about benefits of preprints is that they enable rapid dissemination of research that's true it is a big benefit but it's this uncoupling part that I really want to focus on the true power of a preprint is that they uncouple the system and that allows us to do things in a completely new different way that can be built for communities and by researchers rather than dictated to us from traditional publishers so the normal process you would submit your manuscript and you'd go to a journal the editor may or may not send that for peer review you have a bunch of different revision stages and it can take months if not years for your manuscript to appear out outside in the public where people can use it alternatively a preprint the same manuscript but you submit that to a preprint server there's usually some screening goes on and within 48 hours your work is out there in the public where you can get community feedback you can have a discussion you can generate new ideas you can get new collaborations this is such a valuable aspect of different just slightly different tack to how we share work sharing it earlier is beneficial and this is a fairly standard practice uh, it's increasing every year um, actually since this slide was done this is already out of date there are now over 750,000 life science preprints um, we're a little bit behind other fields where there are millions of preprints 
and this chart here is just showing you some of the sort of key events that have occurred in this time frame. The most recent being eLife switching to a model which is focused on not only preprints but actually peer review of preprints. And so the other benefit is that preprints reduce the barriers to actually sharing scientific outputs. And this really matters if you are in a lower income country. And what you're seeing here is the percentage of preprints that are subsequently published. Most of which happens in these uh, lighter colored countries, but this maps very well onto the economic status of a country. Um, for example, you can see Latin America and Africa have a very low level of turning a preprint into a paper. And this is in large part due to the costs involved of doing so. The other thing we found is that preprints enable us to respond rapidly. And in the instance of a public health emergency, like the COVID pandemic, this is vital. This is genuinely science directly saving lives, which is for most of us who do science, we don't really have that direct connection most days. Um, but by focusing on something that can be released very quickly and then subsequently peer reviewed, it's uncoupled from that normal process, we get an incredible amount of literature. Um, this is just showing you so, some of that uh, in the first few months. And this, the, the growth was astonishing to see. The other thing is that preprints are also now directly shaping policy. Um, this began during the COVID pandemic, but it shows that we don't need this tangled up system of waiting and peer reviewing and then curating. And we can look at a preprint without those other steps and still assess it and still use it in very realistic situations. Um, I mean, you don't get more impactful than your work shaping government policy, uh, especially when it comes to uh, COVID related policies. And so this is possible because that situation is decoupled. If it wasn't, you'd have to wait until a preprint has been peer reviewed. Well, a paper, a manuscript is under, it's under that radar. Nobody can see it. And you're not going to see it until it's been peer reviewed and then curated. We separate that out. We end up with preprints that can be used immediately. And we end up with preprints that have public peer reviews attached to them that we can also trust more. The other thing we found with COVID is that preprints received a huge amount of attention. And the, the reason this slide is in here is this shows what can happen when you open up the system. If people can access research, they will use it, they will read it, they will engage with it more. And this, I would argue, is a huge benefit for, for us as researchers. We, you know, it's, it's nice to actually interact with people who are using your work. And this, as we move forward, I think is going to become an increasingly important part of a researcher's job is interacting with whether it's general members of the public, uh, policymakers, journalists, this is a really, really important step that is already happening. And preprints allow you to get ahead of that, which is beneficial for you and your careers. One of the big issues with suggesting that we uncouple the system is that preprints don't have that peer review, at least not initially. And there's a lot of concern around, can you trust something that has been released to the public and not experienced any peer review. This is only one slide answering this question. There is a lot of data now trying to address this very question. This slide, just an example, but this slide is the same thing you will see in different forms, but all of those papers who address this question come up with the same answer ultimately, which is that just because something is not peer reviewed. Firstly, it does not mean it's low quality. 
and it does not mean it's not reliable. And I want to be, I would love to say that means it is reliable and it is high quality. What I would say instead, and to stress the point, preprints are as reliable as the peer reviewed literature is. That's what the current ever growing abundance of evidence tells you. That's what it shows you. And so the question therefore becomes, why are we waiting to release science and our outputs for peer review? When we can release it earlier, we don't currently see an issue in doing so. And then we can do that peer review process actually in a better way than it's currently done, more openly. And overall, we get a system that is faster and more trustworthy. Uh, one thing you do see generally when you look at preprints versus their peer review versions is things like confidence intervals or the statistics, they generally reduce a little bit. And so peer review is providing a small, and it is a small in most cases, uh, improvement on a, a piece of work. That's usually to strengthen the conclusions. Um, but importantly, the conclusions very rarely change. And when we ask people what their concerns are about preprinting, as I said, that sharing before peer review or the premature coverage, they always come out on top. They're always some of the biggest concerns. And I think this premature coverage comes a lot to this idea that it hasn't been peer reviewed and we need to be a bit more careful with it. And there is also, especially with COVID, but continued since then, this concern about misinformation. Very, very valid concern. We saw plenty, well, we still see plenty of examples of preprints that are things you would class as misinformation. Equally, as anyone who's been on Twitter the past week will have been able to comment, there's a lot of peer reviewed articles that also class as misinformation or have had heavy use of AI without any acknowledgement in them. The remedy is not closed peer review. And I shouldn't really have to say that after the sentence I've just said, you know, the remedy here is public feedback. And that is good for a number of reasons. One, it allows everyone who's not an expert to also see where something should be taken with more caution. Two, it allows the authors, maybe allows is the wrong word, it encourages the authors to be more confident in the results they put out. If you put rubbish out as a preprint, it can get a lot of attention. And that's not great if that's how your career is judged. Right? A lot of us are judged based on our reputation. And if you have a reputation for, for bad science, that's not great. It's good for science and academia more whole, uh, on a, the bigger one. And so public feedback, to set, de decoupled from the journal system and from that closed system, is very, very beneficial. It allows us to correct things quicker, and it allows us to warn people that something is questionable. The last thing to mention here is that preprints don't have that peer review stamp, and that peer review stamp is often taken as meaning that this bit of work is reliable and trustworthy and as i'm sure we all know that is it's simply not true by decoupling that system we also redefine what peer review is actually doing so bioarchives is a really good example here of how we can integrate this process so we're talking about the peer review create model not just these individual steps so you post your preprint to bioarchive and then you can request review. Uh, people can review it without you requesting. And what happens is you get a review and the example here is from eLife, but any of the review services appear in this, this column here now. And that review is attached to the preprint. So now you can look at the preprint, you can read the science, you can judge it yourself, but also you have all of the reviews that are done alongside that. And if so, this is an example where eLife have been responding, but say this has also been uh, looked at by one of the other review services that would also appear in this list 
and then what you end up with is this little toolbar kind of builds up to a trust signal, not necessarily in the science, and, and, and then that I mean not necessarily you can trust the conclusions, but that you can trust the article. You can trust that it's good or it's bad based on responses that reviewers and experts have done. The other thing, of course, is that Twitter is a place where feedback happens, and that's also included in here. And we're very used to traditional peer review reports, but single line comments can be incredibly important for the authors in terms of feedback and also for other people understanding how much they can trust a bit of work, what that bit of work means. So don't ever underestimate the, uh, the tweets on here either, although maybe we'll move away from Twitter. So peer reviewers often act or are often seen as gatekeepers. And I'm, we've got some evidence here from review comments, but I'm sure peer community and have a very similar experience with their reviewers. Reviewers can also be collaborators. And this is the benefit of, real benefit of open peer review is that what we find normally is the reviews are kinder and they're more constructive when they're open. And that is something I think we could all agree on is better for science and better for the authors. The other thing that preprint review in particular does, it opens up a bigger space to actually experiment with what peer review is. I've already talked about how we have this traditional long form peer review, but those individual comments are also peer review. Um, at ASF Bio, we have, uh, we're currently trying to convert journal clubs into preprint peer review clubs. We have crowd review where you have maybe 10 people reviewing an individual preprint and that maybe they're just adding individual comments between them. But when you take those individual comments together, you have a long form normal peer review. And this overall sort of feedback ecosystem around preprints is growing. Um, there are over 35, I think, if not more, different preprint feedback initiatives now. Some are very much that free form minimalist end of things where maybe it is just an individual comment and you know Twitter counts as that. Some are at the other end where it is more formal, more journal-like. The benefit of being at this end of things is that you can usually package your preprint and the peer review together when you submit to a journal and that saves you and the journal time. It means you're not going through another round of, of peer review. The other thing we're seeing, which I'm not, I haven't really talked about much here, is that there's a, an increasing ecosystem around discovery and linking of preprints, the peer reviews uh, and other bits of the research output that we can now think about because it's decoupled from paper. And so I've already said this. So, you know, you disseminate, you, you say, sh share your preprint. That can be peer reviewed by a service. We've, just an example here is Review Commons um, because they have this complete separation. That can then be sent together to a journal who will not restart that process. They'll use the reviews with the preprint in their decision making. PCI have the same thing, but PCI have a benefit of that. They can also do this step in one if you wanted it to, to happen that way. We are seeing, this is out of date, February 2023, we are seeing a growth of preprint review. It's still small. It's about 2%, I think, of the preprint literature, but it's growing and it's growing pretty rapidly. And this is very much the future of where things are heading, certainly in the preprint space. And there are more services coming up around that as well. The other thing that we're starting to see is a much greater recognition for preprint peer review. You know, this is a great statement that came out quite early from PCI. Um, so doctoral schools are starting to state that preprints that have been recommended by PCI are just as valuable and in the same category as, you know, a, an article published in a journal. That's also the similar situation at EMBO. Uh, Plan S is good, good prelude to Johan's talk. Plan S are also now very much focused on this idea that a peer-reviewed preprint is basically the same as a peer-reviewed journal article. Only now we get all the benefits of decoupling the system and sharing earlier and sharing openly. And this is, again, this is something else that is increasingly, uh, we're seeing a lot more adoption of this kind of, these statements and these, these practices. And I just want to end before we have time for questions on preprints and open science, because you could argue that 
open science meets a lot of these uh, requirements and would fit well with the peer review create model. So why preprints? I've already shown you this graph. This is the cost of open access. Preprints don't have this cost. There are other alternative forms of funding for preprint servers. That's a different discussion. But that does not involve cost to the authors and it does not involve cost to the readers. Open access costs the authors so much money that it is prohibitive for early career researchers. And if you're in the global south, you often, the cost of uh, an article processing charge can be your salary for the year. Uh, and there's a, a very limited number of funds available to cover these things there. And these costs are increasing every year. Um, again, this data is only up to 2018. And these things have really gone up a lot more in the recent years. So it's not a sustainable system for researchers. The other thing, and this is probably actually the most important part of this whole talk, open access is dominated by traditional publishers. And traditional publishers have been very clever in how they've gone about things in that they own the entire research system. It's not just about publications and publishers. It's about the discovery steps right at the start, right through to the assessment steps right at the end. And as long as we have a system that is so monopolized by companies that have different interests to the researchers, we're kind of stuck. As we start to uncouple the, the, the publication system, these other things fall down with that. I said at the start, you know, uncoupling peer review and dissemination, that then allows you to put more emphasis on the peer review activity. That changes assessment. Now you can assess someone based on their peer review activity much better than we currently do. You can also see a situation where actually maybe jobs appear where their job is to peer review and you get paid for it. It's an actual job. Um, but we can't break this down without uncoupling the publishing system. This is still the heart of this, this domination. I think, yeah, two more slides. So again, with open access, open access is actually moving towards preprints. Um, and I just want to end with two very, very similar statements, one from the European Council and one from the White House. These both came out last year and effectively what their wording says is that a publish review create system is where they want to see things go. So this is about scholarly publishing where it's not for profit, it's open access, it's multi-format, importantly no costs for authors or readers and you'll see very similar language from the White House. And like I said, the, the PRC model with preprints at the heart of that very much achieves what these two statements have said. And it's where, I mean, I don't know what Johan will talk about when he talks about Plan S, but it's also where Plan S statements have also started to head in that, that very much direction as well. I think that is my last slide. So uh, thank you to all of you for listening um, to the, the current limited staff we have at ASAP Bio, uh, our funders and our board members. And I think that leaves plenty of time for questions.